So my theme is memory and forgetting. And let me begin with a little story. We live in Edinburgh, in Scotland, in the north of the country. And I had to go some years ago on a business trip down to London in the middle of winter. So I flew down and I got on the train, got close to London, got on the metro and was headed for my destination. And it was very warm on the metro, incredibly hot. So I took off my winter coat and read the newspaper. And when I got to Oxford Circus on the metro, I got off the train to go to my meeting and realized just as the train was pulling out of the station that I'd left my coat on the train. So I rushed up to the station staff and I explained what had happened and I asked them, would they ring forward and ask a colleague if they could see if they could find my, my coat? So I waited and waited a while and then the man came up to me and said, we've found your coat, a very kind member of the public has handed it in, and if you get back on the train and go to such and such a station, you can get your coat again. So that was great. So I got on the train, and I went to this station, and I went up to the office, and just as I was about to get my coat, I realized that I'd left my briefcase back in Oxford Circus. <laughs> so I had to explain to the station staff would they phone back to uh, the staff in Oxford Circus and see if they could find my briefcase? I heard the man say, Tenemos un hombre loco aquí. <laughs> in broad London slag, you appreciate. So I went back to Oxford Circus, gripping my coat tightly. And I got there, and I was finally reunited, not only with my coat, but my briefcase. Now, the story actually goes on with even more embarrassment, but I think that's enough for today <laughs> to explain that forgetting happens to us all. It's uh, what my mum and dad would have called a fact of life. And uh, it's annoying, isn't it, when we forget something? And it seems to get in the way. But what I want to put to you today is that forgetting is a perfectly normal part of memory. In fact, it's a necessary part of memory. And I will try to explain this in terms of the way the brain forms memories and the processes that are involved. Now, we make memories all the time. And there are situations, such as at school, where the process of committing something to memory is a very deliberate process, intentional. We're trying hard to, say, learn English, or in my case, Espanol. And you really have to make an effort. But most of the time, the process of memory happens just automatically. You can't stop it. Whatever you attend to, you form some representation, not necessarily completely accurate, but some representation of what's had happened to you. So I think I could probably ask anybody in this room what you had for breakfast today, and you'd be able to tell me. And so there's this sense in which memory is happening completely automatically. Now, the brain is clearly involved. It has a number of different memory systems. And as you know, it has thousands and millions of cells, and these cells have many connections. So what might be actually happening when we form a memory? Well, deep within the brain, there's a structure called the hippocampus. It's just inside here in the medial temporal lobe on both sides of the brain, at least in most people. And um, this area of the brain is critical for actually forming the connections that enable you to make a lasting memory. And the reason it's critical is because information comes into your visual system at the back or your auditory system, the smell, and passes from these sensory systems through various perceptual systems and down to this single area of the brain which is able to somehow connect all this information together. And it, through an automatic process, makes those connections. Now, the person who first suggested that changing the connections in the brain was critical for memory was Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And he did so in his book, 
first published in Spanish, later in French in 1910, and in a very famous lecture given at the Royal Society in 1894. And he spoke about mental gymnastics changing the strength of connections between neurons in the brain. And what he did through painstaking work was to draw the cells that he found in lots of different areas of the brain, in lots of different animals. And this is one of his most famous drawings, which is here in the Cajal Institute in Madrid. This is actually his drawing of the hippocampus, which I've just been talking about. It's a beautiful structure in its three-dimensional appearance, as you've seen, but its intrinsic structure has this beautiful connectivity, which somehow enables information from these various different areas to come together. And we are in the process of trying to understand exactly what mechanism is involved in making that happen. And one discovery was that, indeed, the connections can be changed in strength, as shown in physiological experiments. We're beginning to understand some of the pharmacology and biochemistry. And I, over about 10 to 15 years, with my team in Edinburgh, tried to do a number of animal experiments to rigorously test the idea that changing the strength of connections really was involved in memory. And the gist of it is that a particular transmitter in the brain called glutamate binds to a particular receptor, just like a key going into a lock. And when that happens, it triggers biochemical changes which increase the strength of these connections and in that way make connections between different types of sensory information. Now, you may be wondering if this automatic processing is going all all the time, isn't there a risk that the system would become completely saturated? You're making memories every second, every minute, every hour, through the day. Couldn't the system then get completely filled up? Well, that is what happens, isn't it? You know, at the end of the day, after a busy day, your brain is completely full. You're, you can't take it anymore, right? You've got too much information in there. Well. This is where, in keeping with the theme of subtract, forgetting comes to the rescue. Because it turns out that this process of synaptic potentiation happens very suddenly when events happen, but then the synapses gradually over time, a few hours and at most a day or two, move back down to the lower level of strength that they had at the beginning. So. What does that buy for you? I'm sure you're all aware that evolution is very clever and it works out somehow how the best way to do things. Well, what this buys for you is that you're capturing all this information and then you've got, as it were, some period of time for your brain to, as it were, work out what's worth keeping and what's not worth keeping and let the boring, inconsequential stuff fade away. So. If I were to ask any of you what you had for breakfast exactly a month ago, on August the 2nd, 2017, unless you have exactly the same thing for breakfast every day, I suspect most of you can't remember. Unless you were on holiday and sitting in a cafe in Formentera and the next table had some famous film stars or something like that, then maybe you could. But this information fades away. Now, evolution has a further trick up its sleeve. And that is that during this period of time of forgetting, other things may be happening, which as it were, shed light on the information you've just been processing. They may turn apparently ins inconsequential information into something of some significance. And this happens in situations of great novelty or surprise, or particularly when rather terrifying things happen. So if I ask anybody in this room what was happening to you on the 11th of March, 2004, you will, of course, remember on Thayemi. That was the day of the tragic bombings in the Thurkineas trains between Alcala and Atocha, not so far from here. And it was a terrible tragedy. It may well have affected one or two of the families of the people here in the room. But when we think back to that, of course, 
There's the devastating images in our mind of the wrecked trains that you saw on the news and in the papers. But I suspect for many of you, you also remember many of the trivial events of that day. Perhaps what you had for breakfast, who you were with, where you were, who you were talking with, and so on. Because it appears as though in situations where novelty or surprise happens, particularly something that's kind of terrifying, there's an upregulation of the arousal system and then a kind of print now of capturing everything and arresting this forgetting process such that you keep everything. Because after all, if something very surprising happens, then even the most innocuous things may really matter. So you might as well keep everything. Now, I became very interested in this phenomenon and decided it would be interesting to try to do some animal experiments on it with a view to trying to understand the underlying biochemistry of what actually might be going on. So we set up some experiments in which rats and mice were taught tasks which they forgot within a day. They would learn something, then they'd forget it. They'd learn something, then they'd forget it. So that provided us a kind of um, platform in which we could then, every so often, investigate the impact of novelty. And we devised a way of giving a somewhat innocuous novel experience to an animal by putting him into a square box which was, had a floor with either carpet or tea or you know, rice or something like that. And of course, the animals are very sensitive to these surfaces and they found it a novel experience. And when we did that, then it turned out that the animals remembered for very much longer. The question we wanted to go on to ask was exactly what cells in the brain and what biochemical mechanism may be responsible. And so we turned to an amazing new technique called optogenetics. In optogenetics, we combine the power of light with the power of genetics in a single tool with, that was developed at Stanford University in Palo Alto in California. And the idea is as follows that you, in a surgical operation, implant a virus into a particular area of the brain that you think might be responsible for this novelty effect. And what you implant is something called channel rhodopsin inside the virus. And channel rhodopsin has the clever property that when it's expressed inside these cells because of the viral administration, then if you direct blue light through a little light guide, as you can see in the picture, down precisely onto those cells in the brain, they will activate. And we discovered that there's a group of cells called the locus ceruleus, which is heavily involved in arousal and activation, which also project to the hippocampus and which appear to provide this kind of print now signal. And so instead of giving the animals novelty, we would teach them something, they were on the process of forgetting it all, and then we'd fire up the blue light, and lo and behold, they remembered it for very much longer. So that was an experiment showing both sufficiency, that novelty produced the activity of the cells, and necessity, namely that the activity of those cells was essential for the process that we were observing. So, my message to you today has been that when we make memories, there's this instantaneous mechanism of synaptic potentiation that makes synapses stronger because it's connecting different bits of information together. But the system doesn't become saturated because there's this forgetting process, this decline of synaptic efficacy over a period of hours or days. And if that didn't happen, we'd be in serious trouble. And so what's critical also to the hippocampus doing its job is indeed forgetting because it clears, as it were, the desktop of your mind so that you're ready the next day to take in new information. So forgetting is very important. So to finish, I'd like to speak to all of the partners in this room, the husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends. You've perhaps been in situations where your partner has complained that you've forgotten to do something. <laughs> you've forgotten to take out the rubbish, la basura. <laughs> you've forgotten to give the cat his milk, el gato, el leche. <laughs> you've forgotten to pick up the kids from football. 
Well, just remember that a memory scientist told you what to say. Es muy fácil. Cariño. Disculpame por olvidarlo, pero es normal. Gracias.